Derek, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Eric. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, I guess I should have said welcome back to the podcast. The last time you and I spoke together, we were talking about your first book, Spirits, Sugar, Water, Bitters. And uh, we had a great time recording that uh, over at the Columbia Room where you, it, it seems like you're currently hanging out there right now, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm currently on our heated enclosed patio, uh, but I still have to wear my mask. So let me know if it gets too muffled for you. But I think all of us are at this point used to uh, the uh, K95, so KN95. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so I, I really appreciate you joining me today in particular because we are doing quite a bit of content this January uh, surrounding dry January, which is something that we've always sort of dabbled in. But uh, this this year, 2022, we're active, uh, actively partnering with some brands and also some thought leaders like yourself to uh, dive a little deeper into what NA or non-alcoholic cocktails entail, um, how they're maybe different than what we expect when um, we consume something with an active distilled spirit and other alcoholic modifiers in it. And uh, just so happens that you are coming out with a great book on that subject this very month. So I guess my first question is, um, give us the background of your interest overall in low and no ABV cocktails. Sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm psyched that you're doing all this. Uh, dry January is, you know, becoming fastly becoming a holiday. Um, and uh, I think it's one where we're not really doing without anymore. It's more about what we add to it versus what we take away. Um, but uh, I can tell you a little bit about my story and how I came to non-alcoholic cocktails. And, and then we can go from there. Um, so the, the long and short of it is that I I was drinking too much, right? There was a point in my career where I had achieved some level of success in what I was doing, you know, um, with the Columbia Room as a bartender, as a mixologist, if you will. And I'd reached uh, a point where I was drinking too much and um, I, I really wasn't looking after my health and especially my mental health, which is maybe one of the reasons why I was drinking so much. And so at the end of the day, you know, I started to evaluate that. I, my, you know, my son was born seven years ago. Um, I was growing older, uh, you know, um, I was a business person. I was a writer and, and, and a lot of people were relying on me and I wanted to be able to, you know, be a reliable person, but I wasn't quite at that time. And so um, I started to address drinking in my life and I started to address uh, issues around my mental health. And that led me to a, a, a place where I realized at that time I could not drink. Um, and so uh, it was scary because, you know, I wasn't really willing or ready to start talking about that yet. And I wasn't sure how people would receive it um, because, you know, here I am talking about, you know, how to drink better, so to say. And then I was telling you, no, no, I'm just kidding. I don't drink. You know, it's kind of like a skinny chef. You don't really trust them usually, do you? Yeah, very, very true. <laughs> so, so I, um, uh, I took some time with that. You know, I, I wrote my book, um, Spirit, Sugar, Water, Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World, which we talked about before. And then I really started to realize that, you know, there was, no, there was a way to reframe this and really think about it in a different way. And that way was that this is all about better drinking, right? Um, this is all about uh, getting people to understand that there's different choices. And so because I stopped drinking doesn't mean that I encourage other people to stop drinking. I actually really don't care if a person drinks or not. That's kind of their own business. Um, but I do want to offer choices to people who, um, you know, don't want to drink for whatever reason. For some of those people, those reasons might, might be like me, right? That they have mental health issues or, or maybe they're sober. Uh, for other people, it might be they just don't want to hang over the next day or they're running a marathon or, you know, they're maybe they just have a meeting, which is fine, too. Sometimes that feels like a marathon. But but I think that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I wanted to offer people choices. And so my path, you know, would kind of kind of started going in that direction and I embraced it. Um, I was very inspired by Julia Bainbridge, who wrote Good Drinks, which is just a great book. Um, and, and the path that she was taking, because she was also doing something similar, 
uh, before me. And um, I thought, wow, this could really be something. And, and my partner, uh, Maria Bastash, who is now uh, running Disco Maria pop-up at the Columbia Room, also encouraged me to, to think about it in a broader context and reframe things. And so when I did that, I realized I have a lot to offer non-alcoholic drinks because, you know, historically they could be pretty bad. You know, they could be, or they're just lemonade and, and Coca-Cola. Um, and so using the knowledge that I've learned over the, you know, my career, I get the opportunity to, to share that in terms of non-alcoholic drinks and, and non-alcoholic cocktails. I do call them cocktails, but we'll get to that uh, later. Um, and so, you know, here I am. I wrote this book, Mindful Mixology, that, uh, you know, in some ways is the 10th chapter of my last book, um, but is definitely a new chapter in my life. Um, and I think during dry January, hopefully it's something that uh, people can really get behind and that can help them if that's the choice that they're making. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was able to take a spin through an advanced copy of Mindful Mixology. Uh, I really like the way it was set up, which we'll get to in a few moments here. And uh, you do something that's you know pretty important, pretty called for early on in the book, which is to explain what precisely you mean by mindful mixology. And uh, so I, what I'd love for you to do here is take our listeners through what precisely that is. Because mindfulness, you know, there's uh, way more connotations to that word today than perhaps there have ever been. There's sort of a meditative connotation. There's, um, you know, uh, sort of a, I guess, a, a social connotation where we're trying to be mindful of being good to one another, especially, um, you know, during a pandemic and uh, at a time when there's so much social unrest. So when you're talking about mindfulness in the context of mixology, what does that look like? What's the specific meaning that you're kind of trying to uh, achieve? Right. And, and you're right. There are so many different definitions of it. The easiest way to think about it is like the British use the word mindful. Be mindful of the gap. You know, it means to be aware of something. Um, although I think that uh, mindfulness in general is a good practice and something that I do as well. Something that I care about is mindfulness. Um, but in this context, what I mean is to be aware of why you drink, right? So mindful drinking then is simply, what are your reasons for drinking? Um, if you know them, then you're a mindful drinker. And so the next part of that is mindful mixology. So if you do know those reasons and those reasons you've chosen to cut back or stop drinking, uh, drinking alcohol, that is, because we're still drinking, right? Um, then you can apply this, you know, the lessons I've learned and the lessons from this book in making great adult sophisticated cocktails. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with this, you know, something people associated with uh, contemplative, uh, you know, sort of um, spirituality, uh, or even in some cases, stress reduction, like the mindfulness based stress reduction, MBSR. Um, but it, it, it could bloom into that, but really this is just being aware of your reasons. And so um, I think that's the short answer to your question. Hopefully I answered it well. Yeah, and, and I do think that there's a, a pretty tight intersection with the actual meditative mindfulness in that as far as I've dipped my toe into that particular pool, it really involves being 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 aware as you're mentioning being being aware of certain emotions and physical states in your body and and not passing judgment on those in kind of in a similar way that you say well I don't care if somebody does choose to drink or not it's sort of like you know the, the mere awareness and then the ability to you know be with various options without passing judgment seems to be a cornerstone of mindfulness in the meditation space anyway so I think that it's a word and uh, an approach to thinking about ingredients and how those ingredients interact with the body of the person who consumes them that is really interesting because, you know, in the context of alcohol, we talk about alcohol as a social lubricant. We talk about it as something that helps us to ease pain. We talk about it as something that helps us to forget our problems. And all of those have sort of anesthetic connotations. And it seems like what you're talking about is like, well, no, no, no. If you take 
the anesthesia ingredient out of it, you can still do the cocktail moves, but you're going to be here sitting with them and you're going to be receiving them in a non anesthetized way. Is that, is that in any way accurate? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, you know, um, ultimately that there are some bad reasons to drink, obviously. And, uh, what you're saying when people use drinking to, as you say, anesthetize or, or maybe to deal with anxiety and stress, it's not a good, I mean, alcohol is not good for that. I'm sorry if that's the first time people are hearing that, but, but it, it does have some properties that help a person relax. There's no doubt, but it has too many negative correlates, um, to, to accept that positive part and say, okay, so maybe in the moment you might be a little relaxed, um, but it'll affect your sleep. It'll affect your physical health. It'll affect your mental health. Um, it has so many, um, you know, potential harmful side effects that, it, you know, if, if your reason for drinking is stress or anxiety, that's just a, a bad reason, you know, whereas what we were talking about, something like mindfulness in its uh, contemplative form is a wonderful thing to do to, to, to deal with stress, much, far better um, and, and has a much more positive correlation. So. So I think that like that's that's a good thing. But there, there are lots of reasons to drink. Um, and what I try to share with people is that the best reason to drink is because you don't need to. You know, it, it, that 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 need is what creates problems around it. Um, mm -hmm. it it's a wonderful alcohol is a wonderful piece of social technology. I can't deny that. Um, definitely. When you sit down over a drink, you, you really have this, you know, communal experience or you can commune with people. Um, which is which is a nice part of it. Um, the only thing that I would add to that is that some of the experience that people are having that they associate with alcohol has nothing to do with alcohol. It, it has to do with the deliciousness of the drink. It has to do with the quality of your company. It has to do with the beauty of the place you are. It has to do with getting into a really wonderful conversation with somebody and just getting lost in that conversation. That, yeah. that is something that I think can really, you know, add so much positive emotion in your life. And you might associate and say, oh, well, I felt good because I drank alcohol. But, but alcohol was just a small part of that. Um, so I try to, try to encourage people to consider that as well, that they don't necessarily have to drink to have those positive emotions. Right, right. And do you have, I, I believe in the book, there is, do, do you deal with some of that mood setting and some of the, uh, some of the associated, um, like, you know, taking some of these measures to ensure that like, if there's going to be one element that is normally there that is absent, that we're focusing in on some of these other things we can do to achieve those moods? That's right. I was, uh, you know, I got a, a, a hand with the book. There were eight people who wrote uh, sm small sidebars to it. And one was Chris Marshall, uh, who uh, runs Sands Bar, which is a great bar out of Texas. And Chris has been uh, leading this non-alcoholic movement um, as, as somebody who is sober. Um, you know, he is, he's definitely, and he traveled around the country uh, doing his sand bar, Sands Bar pop-ups. And I asked him, I said, you know, what, how do you create the mood? Right? <laughs> like, I mean, it, it can be a little scary. Like, how do you approach it? And he's and he shared that with me in the book. He shared aspects of lighting and music and what really helps us to create that um, environment that we can really enjoy each other's company and just being there and watching people too. Sometimes you don't have to be with other people. You can still have a non-alcoholic drink and people watch. That's fun too. Of course, of course, and the guest sidebars, they're, they're, to be fair, they're, they're a little bit more than just little sidebars. They're actually kind of like little mini essays or articles that you have embedded uh, throughout the text, and uh, to me, that's one of the things that I enjoy most about the book because I am guilty of being uh, sort of like an essay guy as opposed to, like, if, if, if I could have a book of essays by a bunch of different people on a single topic. I'd prefer that to a book on that subject by a single person. I like the multivocality. I think that it uh, it allows you to kind of 
move around a subject almost like you're looking at a sculpture in a museum where you can walk around it and look at it from different perspectives and take it in in a little bit more of, as I mentioned, a multivocal way. So uh, that was one of my favorite parts of the book in terms of how it was organized. Do you want to take us through just a little bit more of the organization and maybe call out one or two of the other collaborators that you worked with? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I really do enjoy essays, um, reading on sim- single subjects. And um, I picked eight people who I think are really leading lights. There's so many more, honestly, but these are the eight that uh, kind of I got uh, I, I, I got in touch with for this book. It's only so much before I'm not even writing the damn book. You know, somebody else is writing it. But but there are eight people that I thought were, you know, leading lights in this movement and could really, you know, like I thought one of the cool things is you could read this essay and and, and then go find that person and their work and their book or the thing they do. You know, Julia Mimosa is in it. And she wrote uh, The Way of the Cocktail. Julia Bainbridge is, the you know, she wrote the introduction. She wrote Good Drinks. Um, then we have, you know, uh, a, a, a bunch of other people. Camille Vidal, for instance, you know, who who has her La Maison Wellness, which is a fantastic organization. So. So I wanted to point people towards them too. I, I said, this is a comprehensive book on no and low alcohol cocktails. And so in that, I wanted to make sure that they had places they could go to learn more out of it. Um, you know, the information is all in there, but the graduate course, you know, is, is, is you know, like st- step two. This, I kind of call this book like the undergraduate degree in non-alcoholic and low alcohol cocktails. Yeah. And, and, and that's certainly how it's set up. I think it's I think it's absolutely wonderful. And and I, you're right. The, the 200 level class is where you know people are going to be interacting with that further reading from from all these individuals. Uh, now, in terms of uh, you know we, we've covered mindfulness as it applies to mixology. Um, hopefully, we can give a couple of examples here as we go. Uh, but uh, can you tell us a little bit of how you started people off and moved them through these various types of um, no ABV cocktail, uh, I guess, approaches. Uh, and, and specifically what I want to talk about is my favorite chapter, which is the one where you kind of go through the different ingredients that can substitute for certain things that alcohol does, like the chemisthesis, for example, or the texture. I think that was just like having that chapter be so precise and specific on all these different ingredients was super useful for me. And like, if I could take one like single snapshot of the book, it would be that one chapter as somebody who want, you know, if I were to, to try and um, really hone my skills here. So uh, I don't know if you can just walk us through some of the, some of the ways that you let people into the art that you have been playing around with at the Columbia room and other places for the last couple of years. Sure. All, you know, I've made plenty of non-alcoholic cocktails and lots of correlates. So they're like kind of like, you know, or, or simulacrum of, of alcohol cocktails. Um, but I sat down and I tried to think about what would be sort of the bones of non-alcoholic cocktails. What would be the DNA, right? Because if you look at classic cocktails, at least, there are there is some DNA there for a classic old fashioned and how that kind of morphs into a martini or a Manhattan or a sour and how that, you know, has a certain ratios are associated with it. Um, and I thought, well, what, what is the DNA of a non-alcoholic cocktail, you know, in this tradition, in, co- in, in cocktail, classic cocktails, you know, because I think one of the great things about non-alcoholic drinks is that you take the wheels off and you can kind of do anything, right? But these are non-alcoholic cocktails. And so I thought, well, you know, there is this historic definition. And interestingly enough, in 1798, the first mention of the word cocktail um, is not certain that it refers to alcohol. It probably refers to a ginger drink. Um, and then later becomes uh, spirit, sugar, water, bitters, a plug for my other book. Um, and that it comes to America in 1806. That's the first definition with alcohol. But but prior to that, it may have been a non-alcoholic drink. That's at least a theory by uh, cocktail historian David Wondrich. And so I think, um, but, it, but ultimately it doesn't matter. I tried to think of what the sensory uh, definition of a cocktail would be. And this is what I came up with. I came up with the idea that it, that it has a certain um, intensity of flavor. 
one thing you know for sure when you're drinking a cocktail is that it is a cocktail. You don't mistakenly drink a cocktail. Go, oh, I thought that was juice or I thought that was, you know, something else. It, it has an intensity of flavor. Um, that there is also a certain texture to it, certain weight, not on all cocktails, but most cocktails. So, um, and then there's a piquancy, which I think was what you're sharing is this idea of what gives it that bite. You know, like when you slam your fist down on a table after taking a shot of tequila or whiskey, what, what gives it that bite? And that doesn't have to be in a non-alcoholic drink, but it is useful in a non-alcoholic cocktail. And so, so ginger obviously became a, a focal point for me. I, I call that out as, as, as one of the best ways to imitate that bite. But there's other things, you know, whether it's vinegar, like an extreme sourness or extreme bitterness. Um, you can even use capsicum and, and peppers, which I, I caution against overusing because nobody wants a cocktail that tastes like you just dumped a bunch of, you know, Tabasco in it. Um, so I think that, you know, I try to walk people through those and show them some of the ingredients that can be useful for them. Um, and so there are 60 recipes in this book that you can just take and you can experiment with. Some of them, I even say, these are prototypical, try this one, switch out this ingredient, switch out that ingredient, play potato head. Um, but also I just wanted people to be able to like experiment at home and grab a bunch of ingredients and like start playing around and come up with something good. Yeah. And just a little sidebar for listeners, if you do want to learn more about some of the chemesthetic things that can be done with ingredients like um, capsaicin and or horseradish, we do have a, a two part episode in our Breaking Bloody series on that. So I'll go ahead and link to that in the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. Um, so now that we kind of have a sense of your definition of a cocktail from a sensory perspective, which I love, right? It, it's um, it's something I've been thinking about for quite a while too. In fact, ever since I started seeing people calling things non-alcoholic cocktails, I wanted to kind of figure out whether or not that was a contradiction in terms, right? Because if we follow spirit, sugar, water, bitters, it is a contradiction in terms. So, um, you know, eventually I, I did a, I did an episode a few years ago um, where I kind of looked at some of these different words and how we use them and tried to try to almost square the circle of, of a non-alcoholic cocktail. And I, I think I, I think I came down in almost the exact same place that you did where, you know, if we take out the alcohol, we can still have a sensory definition of a cocktail where the, there's an intensity of flavor, a texture of some sort can be a thinner texture or perhaps a fluffier texture if we're trying to do an, an N.A. Ramos fizz or something like that. And then, of course, the the piquancy, which is the stand-in for the alcohol bite. I am perfectly satisfied uh, as a patron to go to a place and if, if they were to um, serve me something like that where it checked all those boxes, then, yeah, perfectly happy to call it a cocktail. But I think, um, I think where we stand right now just like we're at an interesting crossroads in the health debate of like how bars and cocktail establishments are allowing their employees to lead healthy lives and like all of the wellness initiatives that we saw at the last in-person tales of the cocktail. Um, we're at an, we're at a similarly interesting intersection where we have a lot of choices with how we can choose to pursue non-alcoholic cocktail programs at cocktail bars. And obviously I see, I see this book as being a really useful handbook, uh, to kind of get us in a good direction, uh, but I, I wonder if you could maybe talk about like how you think about making positive change in the industry in the non-alcoholic cocktails category, specifically perhaps as it pertains to this word mocktail, which we're not super happy with as, as a community and like where that rubber hits that road. I know this is a bit of an obtuse question, but I guess to clarify, it's like we've got all these opportunities but there are opportunities that we could very easily screw up and miss if we're not careful about how we go about implementing and pitching these non-alcoholic cocktails in our programs to patrons who might still be on the fence. So I don't know if that if that's something that you can riff on. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there it felt like there was two areas that I'd like to talk about in there. One being the, just the plain name of the, what you call a adult sophisticated drink that isn't with alcohol, you know? I think I've already hinted towards my bias in that, towards non-alcoholic cocktails. 
um, using that phrase. And, and the fact that the word cocktail itself um, could be applied and potentially even was applied to non-alcoholic drinks to begin with. But um, it doesn't really matter. You know, like at the end of the day, we're very comfortable using um, words that are hyphenate, so to say, you know, like a veggie burger, um, oat milk. Nobody's confused. Nobody thinks you're milking oats, you know, like little cat, milking a cat. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's a, a reference to, a, what was that movie again? The Al Pacino movie. Yeah. You're talking to a, a cultural Luddite, unfortunately. Yeah, no, good. Don't watch the movie anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that, like, you know, ultimately we're comfortable using that language. Um, so even if it wasn't pre, you know, defined as early on as um, a non-alcoholic drink, it wouldn't matter. We'd still comfortable say non-alcoholic cocktail or uh, Laura Lee uh, band, uh, um, for, from um, uh, Listen Bar, sorry. Uh, sorry, Lorelai, I, I didn't mean to uh, forget where you were from for a second. From um, Listen Bar in New York, which is a non-alcoholic bar, um, she has an essay in there where she says she likes the word alcohol-free cocktails or AF cocktails, um, which I think works well. But but she, she really criticizes mocktails, and so do I, the word mocktails, because it can be silly and insulting, you know? And I'm not, I don't care if people use that word um, if that's what they feel comfortable with. But for me, I prefer the term non-alcoholic cocktails. And I think that that conveys the seriousness of the drink. Um, it does tell you what it is. And, um, you know, it is something that we're comfortable using. But, but also it goes beyond that in, in recognizing you don't have to put the cocktail, non-alcoholic drinks at the end of the me menu where it's hard to find or on a separate menu. You can just put them all together. You know, uh, Julia Bainbridge wrote an article and she interviewed me for it when she was talking about different words. At the time I said, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. Well, I figured it out. I've stopped playing around and trying to like put them in a separate buckets. They're all together. And they, sh you know, just like a, a menu that has vegetarian items and has meat items on it. They just indicate what they have. So that way it doesn't make anyone feel like they're ordering a lesser drink. Um, they're ordering from the same big boy menu that everybody else is. And so um, I think that that's what I've tried to do with the Columbia Room now. And, and I'll, I'll indicate this is no alcohol. This is low alcohol. This is full octane, if you will, um, because I want people to know what they're getting involved with. Um, and But then they get the choice of how they want to feel and they can mix and match. They don't have to, you know, I think that dry January is a good time to reassess your drinking wholesale. But for some people that leave it going, oh, I'm fine. Like I, I, I'm okay with drinking. There's no big deal. But sometimes I don't want to drink, but I still want to be out. And that's okay. You can just order a non-alcoholic drink or a low alcohol drink, or you could start with an alcohol drink and then get a low alcohol drink, right? It's, it's mix and match and it's an embarrassment of riches in some ways. Um, Right. And I, I love how you're kind of describing the the menu aspect of things, because just as easily as you could put them all together and say, like, all right, well, here's the sec. If you're looking for an, a no ABV cocktail, here's the section for you. You could just as easily, easily take the non-alcoholic sour cocktail and put it in your sour section of the menu. You could take the non-alcoholic old fashioned and put it in the boozy and stirred section of your menu right next to the non-alcoholic Negroni that you also have there. Like, there's so many ways to do this that don't that that are that are still making eye contact with the guest, right? Uh, your 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 good friend Southern Teague, eye contact glass of water. It's the first thing that a guest gets when they enter one of his establishments, and I think that you know by continuing to make that eye contact with people and not try and like distract them by like woo like and almost trick them into getting the non-alcoholic cocktail. It's just easier to be straight up about it. Um, and I think that having the sensory definition is so important because uh, I actually, I have a slightly different take. I'll, I'll run it by you. I have a couple of interesting things that to, to throw in about the word mocktail because this was the kind of subject of that audio essay that I did a few years ago. And uh, I actually kind of like the term, but I agree with you that a, I would prefer to drink a non-alcoholic cocktail um, in most cases, in some cases, I would be just 
thrilled with something like a tea and tonic or something like a mule without the kick where it's really just sort of ginger and maybe a little bit of uh, aqua fresca or something like that. And uh, my only beef is when it gets charged for as something that is more of like a cocktail. So I'm actually comfortable with cocktails and mocktail or mocktails and no ABV cocktails existing on the same menu. Not that you're going to see that a lot, but as long as they're not being billed as one or the other or as one another, and they're being charged for kind of based on the ingredient and the care that's put into serving them, then I'm perfectly happy having a mocktail and then a cocktail and then maybe a no ABV cocktail, even though that sounds like a confusing drinking experience to, you know, maybe somebody who's listening to this. And, you know, the word mocktail, I think the the real thing that it experiences is the uncanny valley. Uh, I think in you, you may have mentioned uh, just in passing in the book, the Shirley Temple. And this is the, of course, the mocktail that everyone is so much like so familiar with from their childhood. And, you know, the, the joke that I kind of made was like, well, like most childhood actors, the Shirley Temple doesn't fare well in adulthood. And it's because you know, when you have experienced like what that alcohol burn is and you go and you drink a Shirley Temple, you're like, oh, this thing I really loved when I was a kid and I didn't have the de- fully developed prefrontal cortex that could get all these sensory memories, like tastes terrible now. It's super off balance. It doesn't really do anything for me. And I think that it's just that uncanny valley where it's like somebody trying to sell you a mocktail or a cocktail replacement where you know that that thing is not going to do the things that a real cocktail is going to do. I think that's where people get turned off because they feel like they're getting ripped off. And so I think that the sensory definition that you're talking about and some of these steps and ingredients that you're referencing is a great step to a great tool to give industry folks to make sure that the drinks on their menu are not falling into that uncanny valley and that they're not making their guests nervous about you know, not getting a good value. Cause I think value is still something that people are really concerned with in a dining or cocktail experience. Of course. Yeah. I mean, cocktails are expensive. Non-alcoholic cocktails are expensive too. I think, you know, I, from what I gather from what you're saying, you're saying that drinks that maybe are just like soda and some grenadine, you don't think you should pay the same prices as, as a, a, a cocktail, a cocktail. But, but I do like to point out to people, that non-alcoholic cocktails are it can be expensive um and that's okay there's no reason that they shouldn't be um unless of course the idea is that you're paying for a the the inebriation which then i I often question why why would you get a classic cocktail to begin with because that's made with with exceptional care and it's made with expensive ingredients if the idea is to get wasted, then go right for it. I mean, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying, why, why not just get a shot of vodka and be done with it? Why bother right. with all the, the pop and circumstance of it? So I, I don't really, and I never have bought into that dollar per buzz mentality. You know, for me, the, co- the cocktail, whether it's not alcoholic or alcohol, should, should, should taste the same or cost the same, sorry. And um, I think that that is controversial in the sense that people do have a mentality about uh, the that alcohol, the units of alcohol, actually are what cost the most money. But but you know the non-alcoholic spirits, for instance, which are spirits that are well made, often distilled, um, heavily marketed, and beautiful bottles and all that. There was a, a recent um, article uh, in which Drizzly had done research on their site and found out that the non-alcoholic spirits were fifty cents higher. And alcohol spirits on average. So would that change people's mind? You know, like, um, because it costs the bar more money to make, in some cases, a non-alcoholic drink. Um, I just wrote an article for Wine Enthusiast magazine about that in defense of expensive non-alcoholic cocktails. And I challenge people to really think about that. What are, why are you, why do you think it should be um, less expensive because it doesn't have alcohol in it? If, it, if the answer is because they're using cheap ingredients, and fair enough, you know. But do you know they use cheap ingredients in regular cocktails too? I mean, meaning cocktails with alcohol. Um, and if the idea is, again, just to get drunk, well, I mean, you know, you can sit at home, buy some bar stools, probably cheaper than going out to bar night after night. Just get a bottle of, of vodka, you know. So why do you go out? 
You know, why, why all the fuss? And I think that's what I'm trying to challenge people. Think about it. Um, because ultimately, you know, the, the, the bartender, the mixologist is going to find the best possible ingredients, whether it's alcohol or non-alcoholic. Right? They're going to use their skill um, and the best possible techniques. They're going to create an incredible environment, hopefully, for you to, to, to sit in and enjoy. And they're going to try to make a show of it in some ways. That's all worth the price of admission, whether it's alcohol or non-alcohol. Absolutely. And I, lo I love that you point out that... Uh, sort of assumption that we just gloss over, which is like that you're sort of paying to get drunk. It's well, I, I think that's a great thing to challenge now because, uh, you know, it, I think that single fact to me can stand up against the, you know, contradiction in terms of a non alcoholic cocktail. It's like, well, if you're just drinking to get drunk, then don't you? Yeah, it, it's just, it's just perfect. And it's something that, that you're right, just hasn't really been put out there. So I'm really glad that you're putting those articles out. And uh, this comes at a perfect time in this interview, because I wanted to wrap us up by talking about what the future looks like for non-alcoholic cocktails and low and no ABV beverage programs at, at bars. Um, it seems like you have taken on uh, at least a kind of an outside role as the director of education for one of these uh, NA spirits companies. Do you want to talk about that and maybe use that to springboard into, you know, how these non-alcoholic spirits are proliferating behind the bar? Sure. Yeah. In, in the book itself, ironically, I, I show you how you can make great cocktails with cheap ingredients. I do want to clarify that um, because if you are making them at home, you know, you can use kitchen ingredients and make good cocktails. Uh, of course, you can always get cheap ingredients to make, um, you know, uh, alcohol cocktails too. Um, oh my gosh. I just realized I'm 7%. <laughs> We're going to, how much longer do we have on our interview? I just want, I, we, can, I, we can, we can do a quick wrap up and skip the, uh, skip the lightning round here. Just talk, talk to us about wrap, wrap us up with the, uh, the, the NA spirits and, and we'll take it home. I might even make it through the lightning round. I don't know. So, uh, so, um, sorry, I just noticed I, my computer's at 7% because, just cause I was typing away in my article earlier. Um, see, uh, too much, too much ink on non-alcoholic cocktails. It's causing my computer to run down. Um, okay, so um, I, I'm the director of brand education for Spiritless, which uh, right now produces a spirit called Kentucky 74, which is a distilled bur bourbon alternative. It's fantastic. I mean, it doesn't taste like bourbon. Uh, I'll get to the, I'll skip to the punchline. Um, only bourbon tastes like bourbon, and only bourbon is bourbon. Um, but it is a great alternative if somebody enjoys whiskey cocktails but is not drinking or is not drinking a lot. So that's what it's designed for because you can do a couple things with it. You can, you know, mix it into an old fashioned and it works great. Um, or you could do half and half, what they call half seas. You know, put some bourbon in, put some Kentucky 74, and you can have more cocktails um, without without the hangover the next day. And so so I think that's what it's designed for. And it does an excellent job for that. And I love working for them. The three ladies who founded it, um, Abby, Lauren, and Lexi, are, are great to work for and, and have created an excellent product. Um, and that's been, in general, proliferating is this non-alcoholic spirits, you know, which in a sense is a contradiction because, the, you know, according to the uh, TTB, a spirit doesn't ha include alcohol. But again, it's kind of like, you know, oat milk or veggie burger. We get what you're talking about as long as you clarify that it's not alcoholic. Nobody's trying to fool anybody uh, here. Um, and so so I think these offer a really interesting opportunity because, yeah, you can learn all the skills in my book and 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 become, you know, a, a non-alcoholic mixologist, if you will, a mindful mixologist. But um, you can also, if you like making old fashions, just buy the Kentucky 74 and it's uh, kind of almost one for one. Um, and so I think that works too. And, and there's also, uh, you know, proliferation of great non-alcoholic wines and great non-alcoholic beers. And I talk about those in my book and I try to share those. Um, so, but it's already in some ways, and I, I guess this does, won't help me sell my book, but it's already kind of outdated, you know, like within the last six months since I put my book, you know, um, sent it away to the printers, uh, we've seen just like a huge explosion and non-alcoholic spirits, wines, and beers, and it's just growing faster and bigger. So um, it's, it's gonna be interesting. Um, but you, you talk about the future of it, and I don't remember, I, 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 I feel like in the last interview, I should have gone over it before we did this one, but we talked about Star Trek, did we? Yes, we did, Synthahol. And well, I'm bringing it right back and talking about Synthanol, you know? It's coming, 
that's there people are going to be able to create a synthetic alcohol at some point so this is just the beginning of what non-alcoholic spirits wines and beer can be these are the mon the people who are doing it are the monkey shot into space you know and they're making great efforts but we're, we're going to see some awesome uh development over time just think how long you know gin has been around it's it ultimately gin started sometime maybe depends what you you know what you're choosing as the first uh, inflection point but but let's say the 8th century you know um and and since then it, it's had a lot of time to develop you know charles tangare in the middle of the 19th century started using a uh, a column still and created dry london dry gin and you know uh since then even it's been just developed and developed and developed so the non-alcoholic spirits now where they'll be in just 10 20 years is going to be i think something really special and so i'm looking forward to that it's going to be cool um i do have i'm only at six percent battery so i'm happy to do the lightning round if you want to do it well you know what i think um i think we'll we'll save that and just do a little bit more wrap up here because uh, i just want to uh, a couple of things that you said there was really inter uh, were really interesting to me i think the, at the expense of the lightning round that they make sense um you know you you were mentioning you know the, the ttb ruling something uh, something to the effect of, of uh, a spirit's definition. Well, the TTB also wasn't around when the, uh, you know, the Muslim alchemists were first distilling hydrosols uh, for use in medicines, right? Uh, and, and so really the spirit, and this is something that we're going to be getting into in our other interviews. Hopefully we'll be able to get Lauren from Spiritless on to talk to us a little bit. But um, this is something we'll be talking about in the, the subsequent interviews to this one. Uh, about how you know really what is what is implied in a spirit is that while you're taking the essence of something the 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 true essence of something and you're putting it into a liquid format that doesn't need to be an alcoholic format it can simply be a liquid format and so I think that non-alcoholic spirits are super interesting and super uh, valid formats you're right we're at the monkeys into space uh, point in time right now. Um, and I guess just my last little half question here on uh, I guess the future of uh, no ABV cocktails is, uh, do you have anything that you would ask of or try to communicate to somebody who, let's say they're a bartender at a cocktail program that wants to get into more non-alcoholic cocktails, um, behind their bar. Do you have any advice for somebody who's, I guess, in the industry looking to do a better job with this sort of stuff at their establishment? Yeah, buy my book. <laughs> uh, no, I mean the, it's it's you know listen to Modern Bar Cart uh, podcast uh, this this month. It seems like there's a lot of great information. But just like in the beginning of the craft cocktail movement that involved alcohol, there were so many people like yourself and me and and so many other people who were just out there combing through everything, trying to figure out what are the best way to do things. And, and now it's like a given that you can go to any, almost any bar or restaurant of quality and get a good Manhattan, you know, or old fashioned once upon a time, it wasn't. Um, so there's all these, you know, nerds and geeks and, um, people out there who are combing through everything, trying to figure out the best way to do it and have blogs and podcasts and books. And, you know, so I suggest that people, you know, do the research and have fun with it, you know, discover some new things, uh, if you know if you've already mastered in some ways or or come to a, a place of competency in creating classic cocktails well guess what now you have a whole new thing to learn how fun is that i mean to me love of learning is a, a really essential part of what i do and so it's a it's something that i value uh, and i hope that other bartenders too do too because i think they could really um you know advance it far beyond what even i've been talking about in my book Absolutely. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Derek, just take us through the details of how people can get your book. It's being released uh, through Rizzoli later this month. Uh, where do we go to pick up our copy? January 18th, you can uh, per purchase it. Um, and I suggest that you go to Rizzoli.com where, uh, uh, where they uh, sell, sell, they will point you to a, your favorite independent seller. Um, please buy from independent bookstores and, um, you know, it's easy to get online. Um, you can also come to the Columbia room and, and buy it. We'll have it here and I'll even sign it for you if I'm around. Um, but, but otherwise I encourage people to try it. I, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at ideas improve, um, where I like to pop off all the time about non-alcoholic cocktails and mindfulness and all kinds of stuff. 
Beautiful. Well, uh, everybody listening will have links to all this over on the show notes page, modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. And Derek, thanks so much for being a guest here once again on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Thanks, Eric. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.